Hey everyone, welcome back to the Caring Conference. I'm thrilled to have Bruce McIntyre, a good friend and colleague, join us today. And he's going to tell us about his own personal transformations. Take it away, Bruce. Thanks, Denise. Uh, yeah, my name is Bruce McIntyre. I've been caring for my wife for about 18 years. Uh, she has a condition called dermatomyositis. Uh, it's been up and down. But um, And I'll just share some snapshots, which each have kind of a little exercise of transformation that goes with them. Um, I also work as the CEO of the Parkinson Foundation of Oklahoma. My wife does not have Parkinson's, but I work with Parkinson's people. So there are many angles to caregiving and chronic illness. And um, I'll just try to share a little bit of what I'm learning along the way. So first of all, I'll go back to 2004, snapshot number one. This is actually a picture of my wife just a couple of years ago receiving IVIG infusion therapy in our home, which we do every other month for two days in a row, about five hours at a time. It's kind of a sad weekend, but it's what helps keep her going. So let me go back two months after diagnosis day, two months after the doctor told us that there's no cure. After two months, after they said the first round of treatment may or may not work, we may have to try many things. Two months after we heard none of that, because we had no experience in chronic illness. Two months after all that, one night before bed, my wife came in and she said, I need you to deal with this. Because after two months, I was still very much in a significant state of denial. And she said, I need you to deal with this. I need your help. I need you to be with me. I need you to look at the same reality I'm looking at. And so that night we hugged, she went to bed and I stayed up for a little while and I did something I hadn't quite done yet, but I've done several times since that always is humbling, compassion enabling, and it gives me a renewed perspective and almost like a sense of purpose about what I'm doing as a caregiver. So don't feel any shame or guilt or anything like that about this exercise, but merely it's, a, it's something, it's a, it's a transport to a new perspective. And so that night, 18 years ago, two months in, I thought, what if it were me? What if I had swollen 40 pounds due to the prednisone? What if I had Cushing syndrome? What if I couldn't pick up my newborn? What if I couldn't play with my two-year-old the way I wanted? What if I had to go from being the helper to the helpee? What if I was feeling bad? What if I couldn't sleep and the thing I desperately needed was sleep? What if it were me? And so the next day I had made a decision and I said, look, we're gonna drop our kids off. We were almost too young to drop off at the grandparents. We lived around Nashville at the time. We dropped my, the kids off the next day at my parents and we went on over to Memphis. And when we pulled out of the driveway, we cried intermittently all the way to Memphis because we were dealing with reality. And on that one night getaway, my wife regained the partner that she needed for a long journey. And the transport for me was to put myself in her shoes and to think less about me for a moment and to think more about her. And so I've done that multiple times. So the takeaway on this little snapshot, which has been really important for me, is really just kind of about the golden rule, not about shame or guilt or anything like that. It's just a transport because you can never truly know what someone is thinking or feeling, but the attempt, the attempt to do so stirs up compassion and it makes you wanna do better because you know, now you feel like you know better as Maya Angelou has been so famous for saying. So that's the first little snapshot, maybe even a little exercise to put to the side for later is to take five minutes and put yourself in their shoes. Second snapshot is about Anne. So two weeks or two months or so after uh, we had received some meals from people at our church, uh, Anne called and said she was on her way over with some meals. And I said, oh, Anne, you may not have heard, we're fine. We were not fine, but Anne knew we weren't fine. And I said, you know, you don't have to do that, but she showed up at our back door anyway. 
and Anne had five frozen meals. Now, Anne's husband had passed away with prostate cancer uh, several, maybe about a year or so earlier. I had sat with Anne in hospital rooms, and I don't know if she felt a debt of gratitude to me, or really, I think she was just that kind of service-oriented, adamant person. And she showed up in my back door with these frozen meals. I said, you don't have to do that. It's okay. And she put a finger in my chest, like literally 70 something year old woman. And I'm like 30 something sticks it right in my chest. Like it hurt. And she said, I know your wife's not okay yet. I know you probably can't cook and I'm going to bring you meals until I think she's better. And I said, yes, ma'am. Okay. So the snapshot for me was, that I was very much a helper. I'm always very much a helper. My wife is too, but the helpers need help too. And I would wish for everyone to have an Ann. So the thing is, 18 years later, I've never forgotten Ann. We keep in touch with Ann. We share Christmas cards with Ann. We, she lives in Florida now. We live in Oklahoma. But we all need help sometimes. And so the takeaway that I've found is the word help for some of us is a real deterrent. So maybe a good replacement is the word consult. Just ask for a consult. That's a lot easier to do. So the question or the takeaway here is, who do you need a consult from? Who do you need to just ask, hey, what are you guys doing about this? Or maybe it's a consult with your doctor. Maybe it's a consult with a professional, but who do you need to ask? Probably there's at least one thing you could ask someone, ask for a consult. Snapshot number three is about our daughter. So like many parents, you know, we did our best to get our act together before we had children. We were married for about six and a half years before our daughter came along. And she was about a little over two. And our son was about two weeks old when my, when my wife was diagnosed with dermatomyositis. And so those first couple of months, first few months, we were just reeling and trying to figure it out. And a few months in, we assumed incorrectly that we could keep this all from our children, that they would be protected, they would be immune, they wouldn't even have to talk about it for some years later. But we were mistaken, because one night after dinner, I was cleaning up, doing the dishes, my wife was sitting in the kitchen with me, and we walked into the living room to overhear our two-year-old, who in this little picture with a, losing a tooth was probably in kindergarten, our two-year-old processing what we had told her with her baby doll. And her baby doll's name was Mandy. And we overheard her repeat exactly what my wife had told her. She told her baby doll, Mandy, mommy's sick, but mommy loves you very much. If you I can't pick you up. So if you crawl up in the sofa, you can crawl into my lap and mommy will hold you. <laughs> and she was telling her baby doll that. And so not only did it affect us, not only did it affect other people around us, it did affect our daughter who we thought didn't know what was going on. And it also affected her favorite baby doll. And so that's what we learned. And from that point on, we decided, look, we'll, we'll communicate with her in the best age appropriate ways that we can figure out. Sometimes that's been one of those consults that we've asked other people. How do you talk to your children about this situation? And I don't know that we've done it perfectly, but I, I feel like perhaps she's been able and our son as well along the way been able to process reality as we've gone along. So the takeaway here is maybe who's the child the grandchild, maybe, who is somewhat in the circle of people affected by your situation. And what's the best way to talk with them at this particular moment? Because they're not oblivious. They are listening. They are learning. And I truly believe they are resilient and they are affected. So it's all of the above. And we, they need our, our help in age-appropriate ways as we go along. So for us, that's been wildly transformative. Snapshot number four is just an exercise that I learned in graduate school. It's a conflict management tool, but I think it works great for caregivers. And so the thing is, you know, a lot of us, some of us just take on 
conflict and some of us see conflict and run the other way. Um, and we play hide and seek with conflict and, and just wish it'll disappear. But I love this quote by M. Scott Peck who wrote that old classic book, uh, The Road Less Traveled. He says, problems do not go away. They must be worked through or else they remain forever a barrier to the growth and development of the spirit. He also says it's only because of problems that we grow mentally and spiritually. And I do not like this at all. I would prefer to have zero more problems in my life. But I do find that as I grapple with these difficult things, and you probably find the same thing to be true, that difficult as it is, heartbreaking sometimes as it is, soul grinding as it can be, it's also what helps us evolve. It's what helps us transform. It's what helps us seek ways to make some improvements along the way. And so I, I returned to this at some point along the way of a thing I learned about conflict mediation is that in any given situation, there's a presenting issue. You may have seen this. Pretty simple, but very profound. So the presenting issue may be we have a new diagnosis. We have a new medication. We have a new doctor. Mom can't live at home alone anymore. Dad doesn't need to drive anymore. There's some kind of a presenting issue that is difficult. And we can probably figure out to a fairly high degree how to deal with that presenting issue. But it's really about the real issue. And the real issue is what stirs around in our guts beneath the line. The real issue is about fear. And it's about freedom of choice to do what we want to do and it's about power over our circumstances and the truth is that at many points along the way with my wife and at many points for you it may very well be i've been scared to death when i was in my early 30s with my wife reeling with her health i worried at night am i going to be a widower in my early 30s with a toddler and a baby i was scared to death that was the real issue the real issue is we just lost the freedom to live our footloose and fancy free life. Things changed. The power over this disease, like I can't fix it, but we can manage it, but I can't fix it. And so the presenting issue is the thing, the nuts and bolts of the thing that's happening. The real issue is what's really stirring around in our guts, that emotional part. And so I would suggest to you, and perhaps even now or later on, is to do that. Just draw a line and write down one presenting issue at this particular moment in time, whatever it may be, large or small, and then reflect on what's really going on beneath the line. Now, does this fix everything? No, it does not. However, it does give you renewed perspective. It helps you step out of the situation, be analytical, step back into the situation and say, now I see why everyone gets angry at each other at Christmas. Now I see why we yelled at each other. Now I see where the tears came from or whatever, because it's not about this thing. It's about how we're processing this thing. So I've found that to be a very helpful tool, and I hope that you find some use out of it as well. Woo, golly, these are heavy. Let's try a funny one. Uh, snapshot number five, and this is a horrible picture, but it is my own. It's not, uh, it's not stock photography. So in 2014, uh, my wife and I spoke at our national conference for myositis. We were in Reno, Nevada, and we had, there was a mix up. Uh, we got there. We thought on the first day that we were supposed to be there. They thought we were there a day early. So instead of putting us in the, the cheaper rooms, which everyone was supposed to be in, we got like a high roller suite uh for one night which was awesome and that morning i had no idea i had not checked the schedule events for reno but we look out our window at the peppermill casino in reno and the sky is full of hot air balloons um, at that conference we learned so much from our peers people dealing with the same illness caregivers dealing with the same scenarios we were able to share in a couple of different sessions about, about our experience as well. But one of those unexpected moments of beauty was waking up to hundreds of hot air balloons outside our high roller suite at the casino. 
It was pretty awesome. We were there for about three days. And on the last afternoon, we decided to skip out on the conference and we created another unexpected moment of beauty. Now, I don't know if you're a person that has good luck or bad luck. I tend to have good luck more often than bad for the most part. And so one of those ways is it seems like every time I rent a car, I always get upgraded. I kid you not, twice in my life, I have rented a car equivalent to like a Honda Civic and gotten a Mercedes. It has happened to me twice. I kid you not. Um, so I we're at this conference. And I don't rent cars that much, two or three times a year. But I, I told my wife, look, let's go up. Let's just drive, let's take an afternoon and let's rent a car and let's drive up to Lake Tahoe because we've never been to Lake Tahoe. And so we, I rented a smart car, the smallest car you can rent. And I'm like, don't worry, we'll get upgraded. We'll get a better car. It'll be awesome. We got the smart car. And in 2014, smart cars were not that abundant or, or, and that was the small, it was like, it was a golf cart. So we drove a golf cart up to Lake Tahoe from Reno and, and had a great time tooling around Lake Tahoe and then easing our way back down to Reno. So it was one of those trips that was just chock full of unexpected moments of beauty. And here's the transformative part of it. What we tend to find is it's so, so easy to only focus on and only see the problems because there are so many problems. But, but, or and, there are beautiful things and funny things and awesome things that happen on the same day, the same week, the same month as the horrifying and soul grinding things. And it's not really either or, it's both and. It's just so hard to see these other ones. And so one thing that we try our best, now, do I feel like that every day? No. Do I have zippity doodah bluebirds on my shoulder every day? No, I have to coax them there, but I try to remain receptive to those moments. And that trip to Reno turned out to be full of those kinds of moments. So the takeaway is, I would really just encourage you to think small and think of a very small, pleasant thing that may come your way today or this week. And it may be like you step out and just get a really nice, fresh breath of air. Or maybe it's something someone says. It can be the smallest thing that can avert your attention from the problems to receive an unexpected moment of beauty. It takes a lot of practice. Snapshot number six for me is to celebrate the small victories, even if no one else understands. Um, one, of my, one of the most excruciating limitations for my wife was that she could not pick up our newborn son back in 2004. This is him last summer at Estes Park, actually at Bear something lake in outside Estes Park, Colorado. And that's my wife. And early on, she could not pick him up. And finally, she was prescribed physical therapy. And she went to a physical therapist. And the physical therapist didn't say, what, how many pounds do you want to lift or anything like that? He said, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to pick up my son. Picking up your son is no one's goal, unless you can't. And if you can't, that's a worthy goal. And so she set out towards that goal. And she did physical therapy for, I forget exactly how many months. I know it was at least six months. And then it was around Christmas time at my in-laws house. And, and the way they do Christmas is chaotic. I mean, they're, they're, everybody digs into everything at the same time. The room was full of wrapping paper and presents. And our son was at that point now about three years old. He was almost too big for anyone to pick up. And he got something from us that he was so excited about. And he looked at my wife, their eyes locked, and he was elated. He was filled with joy and he ran towards her. But then he knew and he had learned in his short life, he stopped short because he knew I don't need to knock mom over. I don't need to, no, mom can't pick me up. And she was so excited. She leaned down and she said, no, buddy, it's okay. It's okay. And she locked her arms in under his arms and she struggled up. 
And the moment was not lost on any of us in the room because she was holding her son. That's nobody's goal, but if you can't do it, it's a huge victory. In all of our situations, we have There are things we can't do, and they hurt. So we got to celebrate the small victories when they happen. I've told that a million times and never cried. I can't believe I cried this time. Snapshot number seven. You have enough. You do. You have enough for today. A few years ago, I heard this meditation or prayer. There's all kinds of angles you can take to it. I was encouraged to pray. Thank you for giving me enough. To repeat, I have enough for today. I receive enough for today. And the enough word has been pretty popular in the past few years. It's, it's really spread. Um, and the first time I tried it, I didn't even finish it because I thought that's ridiculous. So, but I tried it again and I kept trying it. And I kept feeling ridiculous about trying this prayer slash meditation as I did a morning walk in my neighborhood. And then finally one day it caught and it's never let go. And I probably do this every week, every month. I guarantee you not a month goes by that I don't do this, that I go out and I just repeat, I receive enough for today. I don't know about tomorrow. I don't know about a week from now or a month from now or a year from now. Oh, that's a different exercise. That's a valuable exercise, but it's different. I receive enough for today. Thank you for giving me enough for today. I can get to bedtime. I can deal with difficulty. Now, here's the thing. Doing this meditation, saying this prayer, whatever angle you take on it, does not make you immu immune from problems that day. <laughs> In fact, most likely you will have a problem that day and you'll have to remember, doggone it, I prayed that thing this morning. I guess I have enough. Or this thing happened, oh yeah, that's right. I reminded myself I can deal with this. But my strong encouragement to you is just to, is to take 10 days in a row and use it as a meditation or a prayer. I receive enough for today. I have enough to get to bedtime. I can get through it. I have enough courage, enough energy, enough love, enough of whatever that you think you may need. And just receive it. Just receive it. Well, thank you for giving me enough for today. Um, I hope at least one of these little snapshots has been helpful. Maybe one of these ideas turns into a uh, exercise that you engage in and that you find truly transformative and helpful as you practice it. But I encourage you to go to brucemcintyre.com. It's mostly a blog-driven site. So just you know, look around, find something you like, uh, indulge, feel better. Uh, maybe find something useful. And then, you know, connect with me on Twitter, if you like, at Bruce McIntyre 2. Or uh, till Monday, you can go to Amazon. You get a free Kindle version of Thrive Anyway, which came out several years ago. Um, so free till Monday. And um, I really appreciate uh, everyone being here. And I hope that some of this has helped you perhaps recall some of your own snapshots that have, even in an instant, been a catalyst for good transformation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. And can you post a link to your Kindle book in the chat room? Oh, yeah, yeah. That would be great. Thank you, Bruce. Okay.